This module will focus on EMS workforce safety and wellness. Once completed with this module, you should be able to list possible emotional reactions that the EMT may experience when faced with trauma, illness, death, and dying. Discuss the possible reactions that a family member may exhibit when confronted with death and dying. State the steps in the EMT's approach to the family confronted with death and dying. State the possible reactions that the family of the EMT may exhibit due to their outside involvement in EMS. Identify the types of stress reactions. State possible steps that the EMT may take to reduce alleviate stress. Define Critical Incident Stress Management CISM. Identify principles of physical and mental well-being. List the causes of infectious disease. Discuss the importance of standard precautions. Describe the steps the EMT should take for personal protection from airborne and bloodborne pathogens. Discuss the importance of obtaining and maintaining appropriate immunizations. List the immunizations that an EMT should have and maintain. List the personal protective equipment necessary for each of the following. Hazardous materials, rescue operations, violent scenes, crime scenes, exposure to bloodborne pathogens, and exposure to airborne pathogens. Describe procedure involved in cleaning equipment. Describe procedure involved in disposal of contaminated supplies, including sharps. Describe procedure involved in decontaminating the ambulance. Describe the steps an EMT needs to take in the event of a suspected significant body substance exposure. And discuss ways to prevent work-related injuries. You should also be able to explain the rationale for serving as an advocate for the use of appropriate protective equipment. As a part of your in-class lab for this module, you'll be given a scenario where there is a potential for infectious exposure. As a part of that scenario, you should be able to demonstrate the use of appropriate personal protective equipment, PPE. Once the scenario is completed, you should be able to demonstrate the proper removal and discarding of PPE, clean and disinfect yourself and equipment as necessary, and adequately complete all reporting documentation. To begin our discussion on EMS workforce safety and wellness, we will first focus on the emotional aspects of being an emergency care provider. EMS providers, along with other emergency workers, are often called to scenes involving human tragedy. People usually do not call 911 because everything is okay. Rather, EMS providers are routinely called to assist people on what could very well be the worst or last day of their lives. It is recognized that EMS providers must be prepared not only for the physical rigors of their job, but the emotional impacts as well. Therefore, we will be discussing death and dying, stressful situations, stress management, critical incident stress management, and other wellness principles as they relate to the emotional aspects of providing emergency care. Inherent in providing EMS is the likelihood of seeing a dead person or having a person die while in your care. In some instances, the transition from life to death is peaceful. In others, it can be traumatic, violent, and wrought with emotion for those involved. Far too often, it may very well be the responsibility of the EMT to inform a friend or family member that their loved one or friend is dead. Given our routine interactions with dying patients, their family members, and friends, it is important for an EMT to be familiar with the different stages of grief as you will find them exhibited by dying patients and their loved ones. Understanding these stages will assist you in helping these individuals cope with their pending death or loss. Keep in mind that there is no requirement that a grieving person experience all of these stages. These stages do not always occur in order, nor are they isolated from each other. Patients and their loved ones may move back and forth, overlapping stages at times, until final acceptance is reached. Additionally, every person is different and unique. The grieving process is a personal one, meaning that there is no one formula to define how a person will react to the loss of a loved one or the discovery that he or she will soon be dead. With that being said, however, these stages are common enough to warrant your understanding. When a patient first realizes he or she is indeed dying, the first response is that of denial, the belief that this could not actually be happening. Death happens to other people, not me. Once beyond that initial shock or realization, it is common for the patient to feel anger, to be mad that this is happening to him or her. This is the point at which the patient is asking, why me? Bargaining is typically the next step in the grieving process in which the patient will plead for more time, to delay the inevitable for as long as possible. 
Beyond or in conjunction with these stages lies depression. In this stage, the patient commonly understands that death is inevitable, but is not all that happy with that understanding. The patient will typically be fixated on things he or she will not be able to do or regrets from previous decisions or missed opportunities. In many instances, the patient will withdraw into him or herself, shutting out or excluding family and loved ones. This depression may also be associated with feelings of fear associated with dying. Then again, fear could be pervasive through all of these stages. Ultimately, if the patient lives long enough, there may be a point at which the patient understands that he or she is going to die and the patient is okay with it. That is the acceptance stage. The patient may still be afraid or may not like the fact that he or she is going to die, but the patient has made peace with the inevitability of death. In these instances, the patient's family and friends may need more comforting and consoling than the patient him or herself. While these stages were described above from the patient's perspective, family and friends may also exhibit behaviors associated with these stages of grief. Some will act out, some will cry, others will remain quiet. Everyone is different and handles grief and loss in their own way. The situation may be complicated based upon the circumstances associated with the death. The younger a person is when he or she dies, the more difficult it can be for family and friends to accept the loss. In some instances, deaths are sudden and traumatic, which gives a patient no opportunity to exhibit behaviors associated with grief because a patient goes from being alive to dead rather quickly. In those instances with sudden loss, dealing with friends and family of the decedent can be extraordinarily difficult. Keeping those stages in mind, it is important to anticipate the needs of the patient, family, and friends when death or dying is a factor. When providing care to dying patients, be sure to always treat the patient with dignity and respect, even if the patient is no longer coherent or conscious. Be sure to share information and communicate with the patient what is happening and what you are doing. Remember as well to respect the patient's privacy and, if the patient is conscious and has the ability to make coherent decisions, the patient still has the ability to accept or refuse care. More information on patient competency to make decisions and its impact on you as an emergency health care provider will be provided in the medical, legal, and ethics module of this course. Depending on the circumstances surrounding the patient's condition, the patient, friends, or family members may express any range of emotions, including rage, anger, or despair. Be tolerant as those personally involved with the situation are going through a difficult time. These outbursts are part of the grief process and would be directed at anyone in your position. They are not personal. With that being said, the EMT also does not have to tolerate abuse or threatening situations. If someone on the scene becomes abusive or violent, the EMT must take steps to protect him or herself, which may include support from law enforcement. Listen to the patient with understanding and patience. Be empathetic to the patient's condition. Even if there is nothing that can be done to reverse or delay the process of dying, your empathy could make a tremendous difference for that dying patient. To be blunt, do not lie to the patient or family. Do not provide false reassurance. Do not tell the patient or family that everything will be okay when such an outcome is unlikely or uncertain. Doing so provides a false sense of hope that simply delays the inevitable grieving process. Additionally, doing so can raise significant doubt on behalf of the family that everything that could be done was indeed done or that it was done correctly. If the EMT stated everything would be okay and the patient dies anyway, the family may jump to the conclusion that the loved one died because of inadequate or improper care. Additionally, be wary of making statements containing religious overtones. Just because the EMT believes in God or that the dead are going to a better place does not mean your patients or their friends and family have the same beliefs. Spiritual advising is best left to those trained to provide it. Use a gentle tone of voice with the patient, friends, and family. You should strive to be a calming influence during what may be a very tumultuous time in their lives. Convey to the patient, family, and friends that you will do or are doing everything that can be done to help the patient, even if that means providing only comfort care measures. If appropriate, using a reassuring touch may be beneficial as well. While included in several of these points, remember that family, friends, and bystanders may have needs as well, especially if the patient has indeed died. Do your best to comfort the family and do not hesitate to consult appropriate resources to assist in managing issues. 
That could mean a police involvement if violence is imminent, or a social worker given other issues, such as a parent dying in a car accident with surviving children. Lastly, if you have to tell someone that a friend or family member has died, do not speak in euphemisms. It is important that you tell them their friend or family member has died. Phrases like passed on, is no longer with us, and so on can be vague and misinterpreted. While it is important to be delicate and respectful, you must also be absolute for those who survived the decedent. While it may not seem like it at the time, it is important for the grieving process for them to hear that the person is dead. Aside from death and dying, EMS professionals commonly encounter extraordinarily stressful situations that may produce a stress response. Some of these situations include mass casualty incidents, pediatric calls, severe trauma, abuse, and the injury or death of a coworker or other public safety personnel. Aside from encountering patients and bystanders in severe stress, the EMT may experience personal stress as a result of these and other incidents as well. Stress is the body's reaction to a change that requires a physical, mental, or emotional adjustment or response. Given that stressful situations are inherent in an EMT's job, one may wonder what can be done to control an EMT's stress. Before stress management can be discussed, however, we must first explore the different types of stress reactions that may impact an EMT. An acute stress reaction is one that occurs simultaneously with or shortly after a critical incident. This is a response commonly associated with an extreme or extraordinary situation, such as a natural catastrophe, mass casualty incident, or the death of a loved one, friend, or coworker. If an EMT is having difficulty coping with a situation and performing appropriately, he or she may be suffering from an acute stress reaction. Some signs and symptoms associated with such a reaction include nausea, shaking, loss of appetite, difficulty sleeping, or feeling numb. If the stress of an incident manifests itself with symptoms associated with an acute medical or psychological problem, however, immediate assistance is warranted. Examples of such signs and symptoms would include chest pain, difficulty breathing, abnormal heart rhythms, uncontrollable crying, inappropriate behavior, or a complete disruption of rational thought. Likewise, normal reactions may eventually necessitate intervention if they do not subside within a reasonable time, such as continued insomnia. A delayed stress reaction is commonly referred to as post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. This type of reaction is evident when the signs and symptoms occur at some time beyond the shock and immediate impact of an event. In some instances, it may take months or years for this type of reaction to manifest itself. Flashbacks, nightmares, continued irritability, relationship problems, insomnia, or feelings of detachment may all be indicative of a delayed stress reaction. Given the delayed nature of the signs and symptoms for this type of reaction, it can be difficult for the provider to recognize that he or she is suffering from a delayed stress reaction. In many instances, an individual suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder may turn to alcohol and or drugs to seek relief from his or her symptoms. Cumulative stress reaction is also known as burnout. This occurs gradually over time to the EMT, typically over the course of years or even decades. There is no one trigger event. Rather, it is a culmination of sustained, recurring, low-level stressors on the person, which may include aspects of his or her life outside the realm of EMS. Burnout commonly begins with feelings of anxiety, boredom, apathy, and or emotional exhaustion. If not identified early and allowed to progress, the cumulative stress reaction may lead to physical complaints, such as headaches, gastrointestinal problems, sleep disturbances, irritability, withdrawal, and depression. More serious signs and symptoms indicative of significant burnout include migraine headaches, loss of libido, poor work performance, alcoholism, drug abuse, interpersonal relationship problems, self-control issues, and significant depression. At its worst, the EMT may exhibit physical and emotional fatigue, illness, complete withdrawal, paranoia, or suicidal ideation. Ultimately, we now recognize that our mental and emotional well-being has a profound impact on our physical health, and it is important for EMS providers to take active steps to manage their levels of stress. One of the first ways to manage stress is to make lifestyle changes that encourage healthy living. This means eating well, exercising routinely, and taking time to relax and participate in enjoyable recreational activities. 
Because stress has a physiological impact on the body, these principles are extraordinarily important to help reduce the negative impact stress has on the body. There may also be instances in which a lifestyle change addresses an unhappy or unhealthy work environment. If you are unhappy with your current employer and that is causing stress, maybe it is time to seek employment elsewhere. True, looking for a new job can be stressful in and of itself, but there are instances in which the long-term benefits of being in a healthy employment relationship with your employer far outweigh the short-term stress associated with moving to a new job. Somewhat related to lifestyle changes is ensuring a proper balance in your life. This means recognizing that there is a time for work, a time for play, a time for family, and a time for yourself. Developing and pursuing a career at the sake of your friends and family may yield financial or other benefits, but at what cost? On the other hand, one could argue that being a social butterfly without any semblance of a work ethic is problematic as well. What constitutes a healthy balance in one's personal and professional life is different for each individual person. With that being said, it is up to you to decide what that balance is for yourself. It is also important to recognize how you are interacting with your family and friends. These people are your support mechanism. It is important to understand that stress affects everyone and that you are not alone. It is not weakness to acknowledge that you are suffering from stress. Rather, it is encouraged to acknowledge when an event or a culmination of events becomes overwhelming. If you are uncomfortable discussing your feelings with family and friends, that is understandable. Unless they work in a similar profession, it can be difficult for them to relate to your experiences. That does not mean they should be shut out, however. Recognize that you work with other EMS professionals who do understand what you do and see. EMS employers commonly provide employee assistance programs and there may be other resources available in your area to help a troubled EMT cope with the stress of his or her job. Along similar lines, there may be instances in which professional assistance is warranted, which is okay. The issue is that EMS providers are routinely called to fix other people's problems. As a result, it is common for EMS providers to not seek help themselves when necessary. They are so used to fixing everyone else's problems that they think there is something wrong if they cannot fix their own. The good news is that the culture in EMS is slowly changing. We recognize that even the most seasoned and professional of EMS providers are impacted by the rigors of their job and that mental health and wellness are important. The stress an EMT feels is normal and that EMT is also not alone. Keeping these stress management principles in mind are integral to having a healthy, satisfying career in the EMS profession. Critical Incident Stress Management CISM, is a process by which employers use education and other resources to prevent stress, if possible, and to help employees deal with stress when it occurs. For many employers, CISM is a part of their employee assistance program whereby employees have access to trained professionals to assist them in dealing with both personal and job-related stressors. A comprehensive CISM includes pre-incident stress education, on-scene peer support, one-on-one -on -one support, disaster support services, diffusing sessions, critical incident stress debriefings, and follow-up services. The program should also recognize the need to provide spousal and family support for the EMT as they should be a part of the EMT's coping mechanism. Community outreach as well as other health and welfare programs are also a part of a comprehensive employer CISM program. It has become increasingly common for specialized CISM teams to be employed after an especially trying or critical incident. In those instances, a team of peer counselors and mental health professionals meet with emergency care providers to help them cope with the stress of the incident. Referred to as Critical Incident Stress Debriefings, CISD, these activities are designed to accelerate the normal recovery process after experiencing a critical incident by allowing emergency workers to vent their feelings shortly after the incident in a safe, non-threatening, non-judgmental environment. Within 24 to 72 hours after a critical incident, the team meets with the emergency care workers involved to give them an opportunity to discuss their feelings, fears, and reactions in an open forum. As opposed to keeping things bottled up, so to speak, the CISD provides an avenue for the EMT to normalize his or her experience with others. The process is not an investigation or an interrogation. It is separate and different from any continuous quality improvement activities. The goal is not to identify potential errors or things that could have been done differently, like it is in a post-incident debriefing or a CQI review. 
Rather, the goal of this confidential forum is to allow CISM leaders and mental health personnel to evaluate the information provided and offer suggestions to the emergency care workers on how to overcome the stress associated with the incident. While we have touched on some wellness principles previously, it is now time to delve deeper into just what wellness means. When referring to employee wellness, we must first recognize that wellness encompasses both physical as well as mental health. From the physical perspective, maintaining one's well-being involves physical fitness, a healthy diet, adequate sleep, and the prevention of diseases and injuries. It is important for a person's physical fitness activities to be well-rounded. That means increasing or maintaining cardiovascular endurance, muscular strength, and flexibility. These three components are important to minimize the risk of injury and other health problems associated with a sedentary lifestyle while maintaining a healthy weight. Our eating habits also have a tremendous impact on our well-being. Excessive sodium can lead to high blood pressure. A diet high in sugar and fat is often associated with diabetes and or obesity. As an EMS provider living life on the go in an ambulance, it is easy to consume way too many calories on snacks, fast food, lattes, and soda. It is important to be ever mindful of what we eat. It is unhealthy to be sleep deprived and in the field of EMS, it can be dangerous when fatigue impacts your judgment or coordination of fine motor skills. Adequate sleep is a must, as is the need to prevent disease transmission by following some simple precautions such as routine hand washing, covering your coughs and sneezes, and staying home when sick. Injury prevention is important as well. Some injury prevention activities include wearing a helmet when riding a bicycle or motorcycle, always wearing your seatbelt, being mindful of slippery or uneven surfaces, and avoiding cell phone use when driving. Physical well-being aside, it is also important to ensure your mental well-being. First and foremost, be mindful of alcohol consumption and drug issues. Most will say that alcohol consumption in moderation is okay and may even have some health benefits, but using alcohol to routinely unwind, relax, or take off the edge can lead to dependence. Drug issues do not simply encompass illegal or controlled substances. Excessive caffeine consumption, routine use of sleeping pills, and abuse of prescription medications, especially narcotics and painkillers, are all detrimental to your health and may be indicative of other psychological issues such as post-traumatic stress disorder or a cumulative stress reaction. Nicotine addiction through tobacco use is another major health issue that impacts both your physical and mental well-being. While it is easier to never start using tobacco products in the first place, those who attempt to quit can work with their personal physician for assistance through various aids now available. Some employers even have smoking cessation programs for their employees. The stress management techniques previously discussed are vital for an EMT to maintain his or her mental health given the stressors and other rigors of the job, and also be sure to nurture and not neglect your interpersonal relationships. Your relationship with friends and family members is an important component in maintaining a healthy balance in one's life. Disease prevention is a component of any effective wellness program, which can be challenging for an EMT as it will be your job to care for sick patients, many of whom are ill because of an infectious agent. Bacteria are microorganisms whose cells lack a nucleus or other membrane-bound organelles. They are also very pervasive throughout the environment, including our own bodies. Bacteria can be very beneficial to the ecosystem and our own bodies by recycling nutrients and processing other typically harmful chemicals. For instance, bacteria reside in the human intestines to break down carbohydrates that we could not otherwise digest. With that being said, bacteria can also be pathogenic, causing infectious diseases such as cholera, syphilis, anthrax, leprosy, and of special interest to EMS providers, the respiratory infection tuberculosis. A virus is a small infectious agent that can replicate only inside the living cells of an organism. Viruses are spread through many different means, including bodily fluids, secretions, and droplets, which may be airborne. Some common ailments caused by viruses include herpes, hepatitis, rabies, measles, influenza, polio, Ebola, smallpox, shingles, chickenpox, rubella, measles, SARS, and AIDS. Viruses cannot be treated by antibiotics, although there are some viruses that can be fought through specific virus-targeting drugs. It is also possible to inoculate people against certain viruses through vaccinations. 
Fungus is actually a primitive vegetable that includes mushrooms, mold, and mildew. Fungi are commonly tiny spores that float through the air, meaning that fungal infections commonly start within the lungs after being inhaled or on the skin. Athlete's foot, ringworm, jock itch, and yeast infections are common fungal infections that can prove difficult to kill. Protozoa are single-celled organisms that are commonly described as exhibiting animal-like behavior because they can move. Some examples of protozoan infection include malaria, sleeping sickness, and dysentery. In many instances, infection occurs by eating or drinking contaminated food or water. The last cause of infectious disease to be discussed is helminths, or worms. These single-celled organisms are parasites that live inside the intestinal tract, receiving their nutrition from the host. This commonly results in weakness and disease. Hookworms, tapeworms, roundworms, whipworms, and guinea worms are all examples of helminths. Infection is usually passed through contaminated food and water, although some are transmitted by mosquitoes and other insects or by contact with contaminated soil or other items. With all these methods of transmitting infectious disease and the fact EMS providers are commonly in close contact with people carrying these diseases, one might wonder if anything can be done to protect the EMT from exposure. The simple answer is yes. Standard precautions is a strict form of infection control that assumes all blood and other bodily fluids contain infectious disease. Body Substance Isolation BSI, is the first principle in protecting oneself from infectious diseases. The goal is to isolate the healthcare provider from all body substances that may carry infectious agents. Those substances include blood, semen, vaginal fluid, feces, urine, vomitus, sputum, mucus, phlegm, saliva, and amniotic fluid, to name a few. This isolation is accomplished through the use of personal protective equipment, PPE, designed for healthcare providers. Another standard precaution is to ensure all of our equipment, including the back of the ambulance, is properly cleaned and sanitized and that disposable equipment is properly discarded. This too will be discussed in greater detail within a few slides. While our discussion thus far is focused on EMT safety, it is important to remember that our BSI precautions also benefit our patients. EMS providers do not want to contract a disease from a patient, but we also do not want to be responsible for passing on infectious diseases to others, especially our patients. The first defense in our war with infectious disease is to routinely wash our hands using antibacterial soap and warm water. If soap and water are not available, an alcohol-based hand cleaner may be utilized as well. Even if gloves were worn during patient contact, hand washing is still important. It is also important for EMS providers to ensure they are washing their hands correctly. Simply placing your hands under running water is not enough to kill infectious agents that may be on your skin. Use soap and generate a good lather, rubbing the soap over the hands for at least 10 seconds. Use warm water if available to rinse the hands. Avoid contact with bathroom fixtures and door handles after washing your hands. Use a paper towel to turn off the faucet and open the bathroom door to avoid secondary contamination. Eye protection is becoming recognized as increasingly important as the eyes are a common route of significant exposures given splashes, sneezes, coughs, and combative patients who spit. Your eye protection must protect from the front and the sides. Because we need eye protection for more than just BSI purposes, the eye protection should also meet appropriate standards for impact resistance, meaning your average eyeglasses are not adequate. Gloves are a must for patient contact. Vinyl, non-latex medical gloves are routinely employed by EMS providers. If working with multiple patients, be sure to switch gloves between contacts to avoid cross-contamination. Also be mindful of the surfaces you touch while wearing gloves. When you touch a patient while wearing gloves and then touch a surface in the ambulance or the pen in your pocket or the scissors on the counter, that surface or object has become contaminated. Failing to disinfect those surfaces later may lead to conveying an infectious disease when the same item or surface is later touched by the EMT after the patient is no longer in the ambulance. When disinfecting and cleaning the ambulance and your equipment, utility gloves are required to protect you from the caustic chemicals typically used to ensure your equipment and other surfaces are indeed disinfected and clean. In some instances where spilled, splashed, or spurting fluids are a concern, the wearing of a surgical or other protective gown may be warranted. Patients with considerable bleeding due to trauma and childbirth are two instances in which gowns should be worn. 
If a gown is being worn, it is also essential that gloves, eye protection, and respiratory protection also be worn. Masks are designed to provide respiratory tract protection from airborne particles, which can include blood or fluid splatter. If tuberculosis is suspected, a standard particulate mask is not adequate. Rather, a high-efficiency particulate air HEPA, respirator is required. For EMS providers, that means an N95 mask. The users of these masks must be fit tested for these masks before they use them in the back of an ambulance as the masks do come in different sizes. They are not one size fits all. In instances where the patient is coughing or sneezing due to the flu or other illness, it may be preferable to have the patient wear a surgical mask to protect the crew from droplet exposure, assuming the patient is alert and cooperative. While it is your responsibility as an EMS professional to be familiar with the proper use and limitations of your equipment, including PPE, your employer must make appropriate training available to you if necessary to ensure PPE is used correctly. 29 CFR 1910-1030 is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration OSHA provision regarding bloodborne pathogens. This federal law requires numerous things of EMS services. Each service must have an exposure control plan. Universal precautions must be observed. Hand washing facilities or an antiseptic hand cleanser must be available. Used needles cannot be recapped and must be disposed in appropriate sharps containers. Eating, drinking, smoking, applying cosmetics or lip balm, and handling contact lenses are prohibited in work areas where there is a reasonable likelihood of occupational exposure, which would mean the back of the ambulance. All required PPE must be provided to the EMT at the employer's expense, and the employer must ensure the employee is actually using it. There are provisions mandating the use of masks, eye protection, face shields, and gowns. Discarding of waste must also occur in compliance with OSHA provisions, and hepatitis B is specifically defined within the regulation as a mandatory vaccination unless waived by the employee. If the employee does have an exposure to bloodborne pathogens, the employer has specific requirements to follow regarding post-exposure evaluation and follow-up. Annual bloodborne pathogen training is also required. Beyond OSHA requirements, other laws, such as Part G of the Ryan White HIV AIDS Treatment Extension Act of 2009, and state law provisions are designed to allow notification of emergency care workers in the event of a potential exposure incident. The United States Centers for Disease Control has identified the following infectious diseases to which an EMS provider may be exposed as life-threatening. Anthrax, Hepatitis B, Hepatitis C, HIV, Rabies, Vaccinia, Viral Hemorrhagic Fevers, Measles, Rubella, Tuberculosis, Varicella, Chickenpox, Diphtheria, Novel Influenza A Viruses, meningococcal disease, mumps, pertussis, pneumonic plague, rubella, German measles, and SARS. If a patient presents with one of these diseases that are considered airborne or aerosolized, the receiving hospital must notify the EMS provider of the potential for exposure. The EMS provider may also request information from the receiving facility regarding the potential exposure as well. Within Wisconsin, State Statute 256.155G allows for mandatory HIV testing of a patient if a significant exposure occurred. Again, each EMS agency is required to have an exposure control plan that defines what needs to occur in the event of a significant body substance exposure. Hopefully, proper use of standard precautions and BSI will protect you, as an EMT, from significant exposures. In the event of a suspected or actual exposure, however, the law requires your employer to provide post-exposure evaluation and follow-up. Given your role in the public health system as an EMT, it is not unusual for employers to require immunizations against various diseases. Given that EMS providers commonly work in hazardous environments, it is not uncommon for a tetanus prophylactis to be required. As previously mentioned, your employer is required to offer the hepatitis B vaccine to you. It is also not uncommon for an employer to require proof that you have immunity to certain infectious diseases. The state of Wisconsin even has its own immunization registry that was developed to record and track immunization dates for Wisconsin's children and adults.
Wisconsin does have an immunization program that requires immunizations of children attending school and regional offices exist to provide immunizations within local communities. Tuberculosis is another disease that is of special interest to EMS providers given that it is an airborne transmitted disease. Annual tuberculosis testing is common. If a person tests positive for a TB exposure, chest x-rays may be necessary. While exposure to infectious disease is one risk associated with being an EMT, there are other situations routinely encountered that require specialized personal protection equipment beyond our medical PPE. EMS is often called to assist victims of hazardous materials. These incidents may be very localized, like the homeowner who inhaled too much bleach and ammonia fumes while cleaning the bathroom, to large-scale incidents of hazardous industrial chemical releases. When approaching a hazardous materials incident, it is important for the EMT to identify possible hazards. If the incident is of a larger scale, it is important to ensure the safety of the EMS crew, which means exercising patience and discretion. While incidents of this nature will commonly involve a fire department response as well, a first arriving ambulance may need to stop a considerable distance away from the incident and use binoculars in an attempt to identify the hazardous material. Given an incident at an industrial or commercial facility, or one involving a mode of transportation via rail car or tractor trailer, various placards may be available on the building or vehicle to identify the substance. Every ambulance should have a copy of the DOT Emergency Response Guidebook to assist in such situations. Hazardous materials mitigation does require specialized PPE, such as level A or B suits and self-contained breathing apparatus. Such incidents are commonly controlled by specialized hazardous materials teams and EMS support is there to provide emergency care only after the scene is safe or once the patient has been removed from the hazardous environment and decontaminated. Specialized training is required for hazardous materials mitigation team members, which exceeds the scope of this course. The state of Wisconsin does mandate that you, as an EMT student, receive weapons of mass destruction training, which will include many hazardous materials awareness principles. More information pertaining to personal protection in these incidents will be provided within that training. Aside from hazardous materials, EMS providers are also involved in providing rescue to people who find themselves in dangerous or catastrophic incidents. Many of these situations require special training as well, such as high angle rope rescue, trench rescue, emergency building shoring, and motor vehicle extrication. When approaching any unique rescue situation, be ever mindful of the threats present on the scene. Those threats could include electricity, commonly due to downed power lines, fire, explosion, and of course hazardous materials. As with hazardous materials mitigation, many of these situations require specific PPE such as firefighting turnout gear, puncture proof gloves, helmets, eyewear, harness systems, and air monitoring to name a few. It is important to recognize the limited response capabilities of an ambulance and its crew in these types of circumstances as specialized rescue teams may be required. Especially if serving on an ambulance service that is not fire-based, it is important to be familiar with the resources available in your area for these types of rescues and how to request their assistance. Beyond environmental threats to your well-being, violence against EMS providers is, unfortunately, a somewhat common occurrence. When asked to provide care at a crime scene or during volatile circumstances, it is imperative to ensure law enforcement is present to control the scene. While some threats may seem obvious, such as the perpetrator of a crime that you must treat, bystanders and even family members of the patient can prove to be problematic for the EMS crew in stressful circumstances. Remember that EMS providers are not expected to place themselves at undue risk to treat a patient. Injured or dead EMTs do not save lives. Withdraw from a dangerous situation and be sure to utilize law enforcement when necessary. Related to this topic is how to behave at a crime scene. Your actions as an EMT may disturb crucial evidence, so be mindful of how you interact within the environment and do not disrupt the scene any more than necessary to provide medical care. Be sure to remember that evidence may also be present on your patient, so maintaining the chain of evidence, predominantly through documentation and conveyance of evidence to police, is important. The medical, legal, and ethics module of this course will delve into crime scene behavior for the EMT in greater depth. 
Part of controlling infectious disease transmission is to make sure your various pieces of equipment, including the ambulance, are always clean. This means cleaning equipment thoroughly with chemicals designed to kill infectious microorganisms on contact. Medical waste, especially that contaminated with blood or other bodily fluids, must be properly disposed of in a red biohazard bag. Used sharps need to be placed into a hard sharps container for eventual disposal. If linens are contaminated, they should be placed in a biohazard bag for transport to a proper facility that can handle biohazard contaminated linens. As previously mentioned, it is also important to thoroughly clean the ambulance after each run, being mindful of surfaces you touched with your gloves while providing patient care. Bleach mixed with water usually works well for cleaning the ambulance floor, but your service may have other cleaning agents it prefers you to use. In maintaining a safe working environment, the EMT must be cautious of workplace hazards that are not necessarily specific to providing emergency medical care. First and foremost, EMS providers are required to wear seatbelts at all times, which includes the patient compartment of the ambulance, unless doing so would endanger the safety of another. As an EMT, you will see plenty of trauma patients at car accidents who would have benefited from wearing a seatbelt. It is unacceptable for an EMT to be injured in a vehicle crash because he or she was not wearing a seatbelt. We know better. Because EMTs are often responsible for patient movement, it is important to utilize safe and proper lifting techniques to protect against back injuries. Lift with your legs, not the back. When possible, use mechanical systems to assist, such as a powered cot. If necessary, do not hesitate to seek additional personnel to assist in lifting and moving patients, especially those who carry significant mass. It was mentioned several times already, but adequate sleep is very important, especially in a profession where one is often awoken from sleep to provide care. Additionally, proper fitness and nutrition is essential to staying healthy and avoiding injury. Be aware of hazards at your workplace, which for an EMT can be virtually anywhere. Walk cautiously on slippery surfaces, such as wet floors or on icy walkways. Some residential stairways may be missing handrails, calling for extra caution when going up or down them. Some residences may have elevated decks or platforms that do not have adequate railings to prevent inadvertent falls. Be mindful of your environment. Dress appropriately for the weather, which includes both hot weather as well as cold. When functioning at a car accident, park the ambulance to protect the scene, your patient, and yourself, and watch out for passing cars if working on a roadway. The list of possible hazards to which an EMT is exposed on a routine basis can go on and on. Exercise some common sense and practice what you preach to others regarding disease and injury prevention. We already discussed OSHA requirements in disease transmission prevention for both communicable and bloodborne diseases. Remember that it can take time to develop both good and bad habits. Establish a routine when using PPE and do not deviate unless necessary for increased protection. Practice routine hand washing. Ensure your ambulance patient compartment is ventilating air during your transport. Lastly, be sure to follow your employer's local protocols and exposure control plan. The bottom line is that you want a long and healthy EMS career. Be mindful of your personal safety and wellness. Follow the advice provided as a part of this module and you should fare well in maintaining your personal health and well-being while also functioning in a very stressful career field. It is difficult to help others when your own health and wellness is lacking. Take care of yourself, be safe and healthy, and your patients will benefit as well. With this module complete, you should now be able to list possible emotional reactions that the EMT may experience when faced with trauma, illness, death, and dying. Discuss the possible reactions that a family member may exhibit when confronted with death and dying. State the steps in the EMT's approach to the family confronted with death and dying. State the possible reactions that the family of the EMT may exhibit due to their outside involvement in EMS. Identify the types of stress reactions. State possible steps that the EMT can take to reduce alleviate stress. Define critical incident stress management CISM. Identify principles of physical and mental well-being. List the causes of infectious disease. Discuss the importance of standard precautions. Describe the steps the EMT should take for personal protection from airborne and bloodborne pathogens. Discuss the importance of obtaining and maintaining appropriate immunizations. List the immunizations that an EMT should have and maintain. List the personal protective equipment necessary for each of the following. Hazardous materials. Rescue operations, 
violent scenes, crime scenes, exposure to bloodborne pathogens, and exposure to airborne pathogens. Describe procedure involved in cleaning equipment. Describe procedure involved in disposal of contaminated supplies, including sharps. Describe procedure involved in decontaminating the ambulance. Describe the steps an EMT needs to take in the event of a suspected significant body substance exposure. And discuss ways to prevent work-related injuries. You should also be able to explain the rationale for serving as an advocate for the use of appropriate protective equipment. As a part of your in-class lab for this module, you should receive a scenario where there is a potential for infectious exposure. As a part of that scenario, you will be expected to demonstrate the use of appropriate personal protective equipment, PPE. Once the scenario is completed, you should be able to demonstrate the proper removal and discarding of PPE, clean and disinfect yourself and equipment as necessary, and adequately complete all reporting documentation. That concludes this module on Workforce Safety and Wellness. This presentation was created by Waukesha County Technical College with grant funding from the Wisconsin Technical College System.